Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So for today, I've waited and I've waited for Watch Mojo to do this top 10, but they just won't do it. So I decided what I do, I do it myself. You know, they call x86 a complex instruction set, and I tell you what, complex it is. This is the top 10 craziest x86 assembly language instructions. Okay, before we get started, I just want to set down just a couple of rules. I wanted to include only instructions that both AMD and Intel have agreed upon. So we're not talking any 3D now, and we're not talking any AVX 512, just things that uh, modern AMD and Intel chips can both execute. There are multiple versions of the instructions that we're about to look at, but I'll just be including one candidate instruction to sort of represent the whole group. And we don't really have time in a little 15 minute video to go into the details of how to use these instructions. Pretty much just be covering uh, what the instructions actually do. With that in mind, let's get started. Did you ever want to add or subtract? Why not do both of them? The first instruction in our list, number 10, add sub PS. Now the instruction takes two floating point vectors as input and in a confusing display of inappropriate naming, it actually subtracts even numbered elements and adds odd numbered elements. The instruction is meant to be generally useful because there's a lot of formulas that require you to add and subtract alternately like this. Okay, sure, that's not very complicated, but I tell you what, we are just getting started. Number nine, PX, the parallel bit extraction instruction from BMI2. This instruction takes three operands and what it does is it extracts bits from the second operand according to the third operand and then it stores the results in the first operand. Wherever there is a one in the third operand, the corresponding bit is selected from the second operand and then once you've selected all of your bits out of that second operand, they're kind of all mashed together into the low part of the first operand and stored as the result. There is also a matching instruction parallel bit deposit, which you can have a look at, which does pretty much the opposite. Okay, number eight, shuffle packed bytes. This instruction is amazing, I tell you what. Okay, what it does, this instruction uses the second parameter to select bytes from the first, arranging them in any order whatsoever and storing a permutation in the first operand. In addition to being able to store any permutation of the bytes, we can actually also store zeros at any position we want. So we can duplicate bytes, we can switch Andianness, we can zero whatever we want, we can generate any permutation whatsoever of any of the bytes. And it all happens in about one clock cycle. I mean, it's fast, it's flexible, it's powerful. Number eight, shuffle packed bytes. All right, for number seven, let's take a little bit of a trip back in time with our time machine. This instruction comes all the way from the dusty distant past 1997 and the amazing MMX instruction set. It just goes to show that the complexity of the x86 instruction set, it's been around for a long time. Number seven, PMAD WD, packed, multiply and add words to D words. It multiplies the corresponding words between two vector parameters. Then it sums up pairs of adjacent results to form final D word results. So there's no overflow with this uh, multiply and add. And the instruction performs all of its arithmetic and its conversions in one fell swoop. I mean, if you wanted to try and compute this without this instruction, it would be so slow. You'd have to convert and shuffle things around, then multiply and shuffle some more and add. I mean, you'd be there for ages. But this instruction does it all in about one clock cycle. So number seven, the amazing and very old PMAD WD. All right, moving on. Number six, the mysterious and amazing RD Seed. RD Seed generates random numbers, but there's something most excellent about RD Seed. It's not a pseudo random number generator, but a real one. In much the same way as a, as a dice roll or a noise signal. So this is a non-deterministic random number generator. It's a true random number generator, if such a thing exists. The instruction is very, very slow. It takes hundreds or thousands of clock cycles. So it's recommended that you only use RD seed to actually seed a pseudo random number generator. 
Is there a backdoor to RDC? Is there not? What does Linus Torvalds think about it? It's controversial. It's interesting. It reads entropy generating hardware. Number six, RDC. Okay, nice one. That was pretty crazy. Let's move on to number five, DPPS, the dot product of packed singles. So this one, I'll admit, it doesn't sound very interesting, but truly this is an interesting instruction. So let's have a bit of a look at it. Um, it's actually not related to the modern FMAD instruction sets. This is from way back, I think in like SSE days. The instruction takes three operands, so it's two SSE registers and an 8-bit immediate value. It performs the dot product between corresponding elements of the first and second operands, and it stores the result in the first operand. But the interesting bit about it is the 8-bit immediate operand. This 8-bit immediate operand actually allows us to select not only which floats are involved in the dot product, but also where the results should be stored. Nowadays, you might use something like the FMAD instruction set to perform your uh, multiplications and additions. But this old instruction dot product of packed singles still offers some interesting opportunities for really mixing things up. Okay, moving on, number four. Oh, things are gonna get awesome. Compare and exchange. Beautiful, kump ex <laughs> All right, what does it do? Well, this instruction, compare and exchange, we'll just look at the byte version. So what it does is absolutely bizarre. Okay, so the instruction takes two operands and uh, it compares AL with the value of the first operand. And if they're the same, then it copies the second operand over to the first. And it also sets the zero flag to one. Otherwise, it copies the first operand over to AL and it clears the zero flag. Right, so... <laughs> Why is that useful? Well, it performs both a comparison and a copy in a single instruction which means that we can use this instruction with the lock prefix to make the instruction atomic and we can create mutexes. This instruction is used to create parallel primitives in parallel programming. Something that we all take for granted nowadays. It's interesting, interesting stuff. Comp exchange, the amazing compare and exchange at number four. All right, we're gonna move on to number three. Carryless multiplication instruction. Did you ever wonder what would happen if you multiplied numbers together, but you just didn't bother to carry anything? Wonder no more, for that is exactly what the carryless multiplication instruction does. Uh, it actually performs a binary multiplication, and it just doesn't bother to carry anything. This one is a little bit strange, I will admit, and we could talk about Galois and finite fields, but let's just look at what the instruction actually does. For binary multiplication, all you usually do, you just write down the top number and for every one in the number that you're multiplying by you write out that top number again only you shift it to the left by that number of uh, bits corresponding to wherever the one is so you just end up with this gigantic sum of all of these bits with a carryless multiplication all you essentially do is just xor all of the bits together but wherever there's an odd number of ones in the column the final result of the carryless multiplication will become a one and whenever there's an even number of ones, then the result in the final carryless multiplication will be a zero. Yeah, so you essentially just XOR. The instruction is mostly intended for use in cryptography, and I believe that it came from the AES instruction set. Intel had uh, the AES instruction set all implemented, and they just sort of said, well, why don't we just include this um, carryless multiplication instruction as well, just allow people to call it if they want. So if you want to confuse people, then uh, you can perform your multiplications without any carries. Carryless multiplication, number three. Okay, moving on now to number two, MPSADBW. This is madness. Packed sums of absolute differences. Even the name is too much. You really feel for the engineers that wrote the manuals for AMD and Intel. When you read the definition of what this instruction does, they're struggling to explain it in simple terms. All right, but let's break it down. The original instruction is from SSE 4.1 and it takes three operands, two vectors and an immediate eight. What it's gonna do is perform multiple packed sums of absolute differences. Pretty strange that, in that that's its actual name. The immediate eight bit value is actually broken up into a bunch of fields. The bits are read as meaning different things. Bits zero and one specify one of the four blocks of the second operand. And what the instruction is gonna do is it's gonna figure out where you could place that little block just there, where you could place that in the first operand such that it's uh, most similar. 
bit two from the immediate operand specifies either byte zero or byte four as the starting position in our first operand. And we just start moving this window across, calculating multiple sums of absolute differences. The instruction computes the absolute difference between each pair of bytes. So it's just gonna subtract one byte from the other from this little window just here. And then it sums up the absolute difference. For each of the absolute differences in this little window, it produces a 16 bit total, and then it saves that result to the destination. Then it shifts the window and it does the same thing again. It just computes again and again and again, lots and lots of these little sums of absolute differences and stores them as 16-bit results. So you can see now why it's called multiple packed sums of absolute differences. That's exactly what it's doing. It just shifts the window eight times, computing a total of eight sums of absolute differences. So if we take the block of uh, four bytes from the second operand and we're asking the question, where would you have to place that in order that uh, it's most similar to some block from the first operand. That's really what the instruction is intended to figure out. And you might be thinking, well, how do you find the smallest value then out of the first operand once you've computed this multiple sums of absolute differences? But there's actually another instruction. PH min pos UW, it's a horizontal minimum. It's actually gonna save the minimum value in uh, the first word of the destination. And it's also gonna save the index of that smallest value in the second word. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff, really. Uh, absolutely crazy complex instruction. I think it's mostly used for video codecs. Yeah, but you could use it for whatever you want. All right, but moving right along, the chaos and the madness have reached their peak. The SSE 4.2 string comparison instructions. Let's have a look. Okay, so there's four instructions here, but they're really just one instruction with a whole bunch of different options available in the mnemonics. So let's just call it PCOMP X STR X for all four instructions. We've got uh, a choice of I or E, and we've also got a choice of I or M on the end of the mnemonic. The IE specifies whether the length of the string is implicit or explicit, meaning uh, if it's a null terminated string or if we've actually specified the lengths in RAX and RDX. And the other bit on the end of the mnemonic, the IM just here specifies whether we want the index or if we want a mask of the results. The index, if you want that, is stored in a RCX. But other than that, the four string instructions are all the same. All right, so first of all, there's three operands. We take two SSE registers and an immediate eight on the end, and the two vectors are inputs, and the immediate eight specifies the comparison. Bits zero and one of the immediate eight specify one of the uh, four data types. We've got zero, zero means that the strings are to be read as unsigned bytes. Then we've got one, which represents unsigned words. We've got one, zero or two, which represents signed bytes and one, one, which represents signed words. So the next bits actually specify the test that we're actually doing. So you can have uh, four different tests. Zero, zero means subset. And we're gonna test if each of the characters from the second operand occurs in the first operand. Then the zero one operation tests ranges and the first operand contains pairs of characters which represent inclusive ranges. So you could have something like AZ and then a lowercase AZ and that would indicate two ranges. That would mean that you're after letters, either uppercase or lowercase. Uh, then we've got one zero which is match this one pretty much just does a basic match of characters, one for one. And the final one, one one, is actually a substring search. So this will actually search the uh, operand for a substring and tell you any places where the substring occurs. That's the first four bits of the immediate operand, but there's more bits. There's more craziness. So bits four and five specify intermediate processing. So you can actually complement the results if you want. And you can also, oh, you can also uh, apply this complement to the entire string and not just the valid bits. So the valid bits are the bits inside the string if you've specified the length of it. Uh, then we've got bit six. So bit six specifies if we want a bit mask or a byte mask, sort of everything really squashed together or a byte mask. So if you're returning indices instead of masks, then this bit actually specifies whether you want the index of the first occurrence or the index of the final occurrence of uh, string or byte or whatever that passes the test. I mean, it's absolutely amazingly complicated and just extremely flexible, these uh, SSE 4.2 string instructions. All up, I think if you count it all out, they constitute something like 512 different possible operations that you can do, just depending on the mnemonic and the encoded operation and the immediate bytes. 
Uh, the instructions are truly amazingly complicated, and that is why SSE 4.2 string instructions are the craziest instructions of all. Okay, well that was my top 10 list. That was fun. Truth be told, we could pretty easily do another top 10. I mean, there's so much madness in this instruction set, but hopefully learning some of those more obscure, uh, more complicated instructions was, uh, was interesting, and I just want to say thank you very much for watching. Have a good one.